everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bickney, and with me is my good friend, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Very good. Mark, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. We have a correction to issue from last week. This is entirely my fault. I had made a comment that Capital Lux 2 Pocket, which is the pocket edition of Capital Lux 2 Generations, only had four power variations. I was incorrect on this. A number of people were very helpful to, to correct us on this. This was an error. We regret it. There are 12 powers in Capital X2 Pocket. They, the only powers that they jettison are the slightly more outre ones that we kind of like, like the rocket ship. This is not to say that it's an inferior product, but just to make things perfectly clear, if you want the smaller, cheaper, more pocketable version, namely Capital X2 Pocket, you're not missing out on 12 powers. You're only missing out on four. We apologize for the correction. I, for one, have sent back the Golden Geek Award to Board Game Geek. I have informed Quinns and Shut Up and Sit Down that I cannot in good conscience appear at Shucks. Instead, I've told them to draw a cartoon face on the copy of Tigers and Euphrates, put it next to a copy of The Grounding for the Metaphysics of Morals, and a Neo Geo Mini. That's mostly the experience you get from listening to me anyway, and it'll probably leave listeners happy. It'll probably confuse me. I'll probably be sold (laughs) until the very last minute. (laughs) So, this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to talk about the game we reviewed last year, the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And then our topic this week is what a campaign needs, what we're looking for in terms of board game campaigns. Because contrary to our objections, every single last game published last year had a campaign mode. Well, on average, some of them had multiple campaign modes, so you know that evens out for the one. It's so true. you know, on average, there's been one campaign. This is this is a lie. This is what we would call a grotesque exaggeration. It's called content. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I'm creating content. <laughs> so, Walker, what did I'm, we review last? Year? I'm surprised you remembered this one, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, this being said, <laughs> it was. Tungaru. This is designed by Lewis Maltz and Stefan Maltz and put out by Alley Cat Game. When I first saw what it was, I'm like, wait, what? We reviewed this? What? I, what is this game? I had to look at pictures to remind myself. I seldom have this experience, Walker. It's true, and it was forgettable, but it did some good things. Like as as I was I was as I was trying to remember, there were some things that I remembered. The fact that it is sort of worker placement, and you're actually transporting your workers around in a boat, kind of novel, sort of tableau building. You're going around the islands collecting these tiles, which you know improves your tableau. When squinting at the game's description and at the components, I vaguely remembered some details, and then I saw that I had rated it on Board Game Geek a 6, which I definitely put into the category of not particularly offensive, but definitely for- forgettable. So, good rating. Yeah, it, cl- it definitely lived up to its rating. <laughs> yeah, it is not a game that I kept. Uh, I would happily play it. I remember I had fond memories of it, and the production was over the top interesting and and colorful and good but other than that it really didn't bring too much to the table i would strongly prefer to play something else anyway that was tungaru by lewis and stefan maltz walker what'd you play last week mark i got to get an actual real game of blood rage to the table at the local game meetup this is designed by eric lang and put out by cool mini or not Still a joy. We did a full drafting every round and got the game taught to a couple new players and played in under two hours. It was a joy. I couldn't help but notice you've also got some games going on Board Game Arena. Board Game Arena also has Blood Rage. It's uh, a lot of people that have moved away still enjoy it. And there's con- a constant game of Blood Rage going on with some of the older group. Yeah, Blood Rage has aged really well, and it's definitely popular locally and with former locals. I have played it intermittently ever since it first got released, and I think it's definitely aged better than Rising Sun has. Who knows how well Ankh is going to age? Times are... It's tough to tell. Ankh Ankh seems far more of a niche product. And that's one thing that you can say about Blood Rage. It seems to appeal to a broader cross-section of people than either Rising Sun or Ankh. Yeah, well, I just don't know the numbers, so I can't really comment. But definitely there seemed to be more of a... uh sort of store presence of Blood Rage. Like it, there was, it was put out to retailers where I don't think Ankh got that much, you know, internal support by retailers. That is speculating about stuff that I don't know. Just in yeah. terms of the the staying power of people wanting to play, it seems to be relatively high. And I still really like Blood Rage. I, you know, I prefer Ankh, but that's not, that's not to diminish Blood Rage in any way. It could also be the time that it was released, right? Blood Rage, height of conventions and no pandemic. 
Onk, no conventions, massive <laughs> pandemic, right? I think Onk is a more niche title. I mean, as we've said before, it is the game with wild powers for people who like Euro games, and it is the game for Euro gamers for those who play games with wild powers. And that precise intersection definitely hits all our notes, but it's like the game that Reiner Knizia and Eric Lang would, would co-design together, which is a strange pairing. Blood Rage is great because many different ways to play, try to destroy your wars, get points that way. I went with the quest. Everyone seemed to not care about the quests or think they weren't as powerful. So I did nothing but quests and it seemed to work well. Did you get Odin's Throne? The doubles quests in Era 3? I did not. Oh. Yeah, I, did, I did not even see it. So I don't even think it was out. Well then, or perhaps someone buried it for you. Maybe. Maybe they were paying attention to all your questing. Could have been. That was the start of Adrian Smith as well, and he went on to do many projects like... Like Rising Sun and like... Hey! Yes, you pronounced it correctly, absolutely. That is Blood Rage. Walker got to show me Wormholes by Peter McPherson and Alderac Entertainment Group. Wormholes is an incredibly straightforward and approachable sort of root connection game, whereby you basically get to move three spaces a turn, but you get to plop out wormholes for free, and you can move between wormholes for free. Ultimately, it's all about delivering passengers, and mostly when I was playing Wormholes, I felt it for what it was, and really appreciated how stripped down and straightforward it was. But by the same token, number one, it's not my kind of game. It very much hit the spatial puzzle aspects that I tend not to enjoy in lots of games like this. And also, I couldn't but feel that maybe they could have done a little bit more to embellish the world. Now, just get, just to give you an a- example, in Merchants of Venus, which is a Richard Hamlin design from the 80s, there is a whole backstory for all of the passengers. Anytime a passenger wants to get delivered somewhere, there's an explanation about who they are and why they wanted to do this and where why they're going, what they're going, and, and this, that, and the other. And it was interesting. It gave a little bit of texture to the world. Merchant of Venus is drowning in texture and a whole bunch of interesting things constantly happening and in the case of wormholes all you're doing is delivering passengers but there's no picture of the passengers anywhere you just have the the picture of the destination planet so that's all there is now i can understand that they wanted to make the cards clear to uh, clear to read and they absolutely accomplished that goal but it's just an indication about how there's not really much personality as to anything that occurs in a game of wormholes it would be a lot of extra art assets but it'd be awesome if like you said on the bottom of the card there was just like a speech bubble from the from the alien right a little you know, a portrait of them with right. a little speech bubble. With some Actually, sort of absurd would, comment yeah. about, I mean, some weird cultural fair or some yeah. religious quest they're on or the weather at that time of year. Yeah, I mean, yes, there were some graphical flourishes. Like there's one planet that looks like a large tribble. That's kind of interesting. But as I say, it would I, I would have liked a little bit more personality. I would have liked a little bit more going on other than just a brutal question of get from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. You're counting out spaces, not tediously. It's all very straightforward, but basically you're just counting out spaces, trying to figure out if you can get there in six moves rather than seven, and maybe in five moves rather than six, things like that. And I found it perfectly pleasant, but it's not the kind of thing that I would go back to because I don't think that it really elevated the form past a brutal exercise in in accounting. Basically, it's a different kind of accounting, where you're just accounting spaces. And it did a great job with a minimal rule set, not necessarily the thing that I would go back to. Yeah, it falls a little bit of the ticket to ride problem, where sometimes you're just going to happen to draw the exact cards you need, and and the next person will not. But I got to say, in terms of elegance of rules, I think Wormholes gets a lot right. Wormholes. Wormholes. Mark was nice enough to introduce me to Envelopes of Cash. This is a review prototype copy provided by the publisher, and it's designed by Andy Schwartz and put out by Envelopes of Cash, LLC. I guess they're not planning too much in the future. Well, otherwise it's a staggering coincidence. Yeah, there you go. Um, So in Envelopes of Cash, you're on a tour bus floating around uh, America picking up Football players, all the while corrupting the rest of the world. Oh, you corrupt the football players too. Oh, you corrupt the football <laughs> players too. It's a very much uh, a sort of plan ahead type game. There's dice rolled, and you need to sort of allocate your budget for the year. You roll a five, and that means five units of cash five turns from now. Or you could take half of it, and you get to spend it wherever you like. You could put it right right in the turn that you want, or you sort of have to pre-program where you're going to put it. So definitely the first game for players is going to be a bit of a 
hurdle because there is a giant deck of cards that you're constantly trying to add to your tableau and they do all sorts of different things. So trying to pick sort of a strategy or, or a certain path to go will be a little difficult in your first game. And also, you know, figuring out this sort of programming a whole year and ahead, you don't need, it's not, I should, that's making it a little more complicated than it is. Just pre-programming your budget is a little, you know, hard, especially when you don't know what kind of cards are coming out. One thing that the rules do a good job of, and I tried to convey but didn't do a very good job of conveying, was that your first few turns are going to be largely uneventful, precisely because of the system of generating cash. You can generate large quantities of cash, but for the future. So your first few turns are not apt to be particularly consequential. But, you know, in games like this, you want there to be a kind of an arc as the decisions start to expand. As you have more and more resources available to you, as you're able to draw on the cards you've played in previous rounds, and you have a bigger, better picture of the data, I will, of course, concede that when you're first starting out and you're getting a peek at the large deck full of different cards, it can be a little bit difficult to pick out a synergistic strategy right at the gate. But then again, I've also found that in my playings of Envelopes of Cash, I could play more reactively and still end up with a reasonably good setup. It's not the kind of thing where in order to score well, you desperately need all the cards to speak to each other in a very, very clear way. So the fundamental resource allocation system, which I still adore, has been ripped straight from Macau, the Stefan Feld game. And this is very, very much acknowledged by the designer and I really do appreciate the fact that now instead of sailing around in a vaguely colonialist setting and getting a variety of abstracted trade goods instead what we're doing is we are touring around the country and bribing young promising student athletes to become unpaid laborers for the benefit and glory of the people who work at the university and As I've commented before, this isn't the kind of thing where the theming is paper thin. The entire game, you're looking at these cards and you're thinking, this is a terrible policy, but it will suit my needs very nicely. (laughs) I think I'll try to put it into play. It's like, ooh, young quarterback from Nebraska, you shall be mine and you shall have all the bling you request. It's marvelous fun. I think it's just the right level of economic pre-planning coupled with social commentary that you seldom see. Most of the time, when games want to be comical and have some kind of message, they're typically just light party games. And those often don't satisfy it from a gameplay perspective. Honestly, the one designer who who kind of operates at this level that comes to mind, and this is high praise to be compared, is Vlada Kvatel, right? Who is willing to design somewhat heavier management games where at the same time the theme is whimsical and or satirical and or comical. And so I really give credit to Andy Schwartz, the bones may have been ripped straight from Macau, but I think he's really made it his own, and especially because of the the sort of message that the game is delivering. And as somebody, I admit, I don't really have any skin in the game as far as football is concerned, but as somebody who worked in higher education for many, many years, I've seen the effect that athletics programs sometimes have on higher education. No pigskin in the game? There's definitely pigskin in the game. Just saying. So sometimes you can you can have a, a serious message and mix it in with jokes, Walker. Uh, like Andy, Andy Schwartz, Vlada Kvadl, they can do those things. I don't think this was an example of, of, of it working very well. No. Um, no, I, I confess I don't. That's too bad. Lots of different ways you can score in envelopes of cash. There's set collection going on. There is area sort of control, trying to get players all from a certain district. Lots of different ways to do it. Envelopes of cash. Played another game of Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan. This is up on Kickstarter right now. You've probably heard us talk about it over the past few weeks. This is Gordon Kalea's app-driven campaign quick combat encounter game. Sort of building on the ideas of vengeance and vengeance roll and fight and marrying it to a sort of fantasy campaign driven by an app. And I went back to it largely because there was supposed to be a boss fight to cap off the first few encounters. And I was vaguely curious about how that was going to shake out because all throughout we've had basically the same two concerns over Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan. One of them is how different are the campaign encounters going to be? Can it sustain you know, upwards of a dozen or several dozen different campaign encounters without feeling samey. And number two, does the app and the attendant narrative really add to the experience? Now, as far as the latter is concerned, and this is actually something that I said to Gordon Kalea specifically, I signed up to be a board game critic, not a bug tester for software. And so dealing with pre-release software is honestly not something I think I'd do again. I think in future, if anybody offers me, hey, we've got this pre-release prototype to, to mess around with. Normally, our standards for that are very, very high, and we seldom look at them. And if there's an app involved, I think in the future, I'm just going to say no, just hard pass, because there's too many variables, and wrestling with the technical challenges is, quite frankly, not to my strengths. So, setting all that aside, I will say that the 
early encounter, specifically the first encounter, which we all felt was thematically desperately unsatisfying, they've changed that. And it's now much, much better in context, and they're definitely trying to breathe more life into the world. And specifically this aspect of the narrative that I find fascinating, which is that the protagonists are others. The protagonists are basically in the view of all the NPCs from the sticks. And as a consequence, they're subject to a certain degree of othering, derision, suspicion, a whole bunch of other things. Whereas we are sort of emissaries from a culture that we're trying to protect. That sort of disjuncture is a step away from the normal sort of power fantasy that you see endlessly in these kind of campaign systems. More on that later. And that part brought right to the forefront for the first encounter. I really, really, really appreciate it. And the boss fight did feel different from the other fights involved. So over the course of having played Fate Forge about a dozen times now, mostly the early encounter several times, in part because the app kept forgetting to save our progress, there are variations on a theme. The undead fight very differently from your standard human guards. There was one encounter where we had to chase down a thief and that felt very different. And then there was a boss fight and these all felt very different. So all of this is to say, despite the technical hurdles, despite my ongoing misgivings about app-driven games in general, about campaign systems in general, I have pledged for Fate Forward Chron Chronicles of Khan. My last set of misgivings have just been overwhelmed enough by virtue of the attention that they're continuing to put into the game about selling the universe, selling the settings, setting the characters, and making that unique and engaging. That married to a combat system which we've always loved and have never had any problems with... I think I am really going to enjoy the final product. It is very expensive on Kickstarter. That's a decision to, be, uh, to make for yourself. But at the very least, it is not going to be a sprawling multi-box nightmare. It is a somewhat more self-contained experience, and the components are much more minimalistic. You know, they use discs instead of miniatures for all the NPCs and for all the enemies you're going to be fighting, except for some of the bosses. So I feel like I can more conscientiously invest in a product such as this. And I am genuinely enthusiastic to see the final product. This, despite having wrestled with technical problems, I think that's a bit of an accomplishment. So I am vaguely optimistic. And it's kind of weird, right? Because a lot of the systems that I remember do it the opposite. The, like the everyday troopers are represented by models, whereas the bosses that only show up once in a, in a, in a whole kind of <laughs> campaign are always either tokens or counters. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily support the need for having the bosses be miniatures. That part seemed a little bit extraneous. And indeed, in our prototype, there is a very large miniature for the, the, the wizard boss who shows up once and doesn't really move. I mean, I guess it's a way to signal this is an important fight. This is a big deal. But I agree with you. I think even standees would have done it. You could have included that in the punch board, just standees for the bosses. At that point, they have a verticality that the other enemies don't. But, you know, this is, I, I'm comparing it in my head to most other campaign fantasy games, whether it's Stars of Icarus or Gloomhaven or whatever, in trying to be slightly more minimalistic, both in terms of footprint and indeed in terms of shelf space. Uh, I can definitely get behind Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan much sooner than I can to all these iterations of these other, uh, these other campaign based games. So that was more the comparison set I had in mind. And that is Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan by Gordon Kalea and Mighty Boards. It is on Kickstarter right now. And of course, they say it'll be out at a certain time, but uh, who knows? <laughs> In two years, we'll enjoy it. When it shows up, it shows up. We got to play another game of Albedo. This is designed by Kai Herberts and published by Herberts Entertainment UG. Nepotism. 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 So if you ever think that Core Worlds takes too long to play and you want a shorter version of Core Worlds, this, I think, is represents the same sort of thing, not exactly, but will give you the same feel as Core Worlds, but in a much shorter package. You are sort of deck building an army, either Air Force or, or ground support. You're attacking planets to get more cards and take the planets for victory points. All sorts of interesting things going on, different factions, interesting cards, pretty good art. What, what do you think of your another play of Albedo? I really like Albedo. I think it's a winner. I think it's one of those games that looks at other deck builder games and say, why can't we just ramp this up and get this started much sooner? The default faction has a starting deck of nine cards and a hand size of six, which means that you'll be seeing cards you purchased in the second turn of the game. <laughs> so Albedo is very much not interested in wasting time. You're really out there. Now, as far as the cards are concerned, that is one area in which I think Albedo kind of suffers, right? You don't get the same kind of cool personality-laden cards that you might see in a game of Core Worlds, or even in lots of other deck builders, where you see lots of very interesting types of cards with special powers and interesting interactions. Here, mostly, you're just fiddling around with currency, which is normally something I don't like, 
unique in a deck building game. But in Albedo, that's pretty much all you're doing, so it kind of shakes out okay, and you're not going to be playing for very long, so it's not like, oh, here's my robotic infantry again. So <laughs> every round, you're basically doing blind bids for a variety of resources that are available on two planets, and what really makes it sing, I think, and what makes Albedo, I think, my favorite blind bidding game ever, which, given that Knizia has designed a lot of blind bidding games as high praise, is that if you go in deep for a particular planet and somebody outbids you, you don't go home empty-handed. There's usually a way, and this is what makes a great play distinguished from a good play. A good play is the one where you beat your opponents and you get what you wanted. A great play is where, even if you hadn't beaten your opponents, you could still get something good. And I like that challenge of trying to figure out, it's like, well... I could really sense this victory, or I could make it so I have two smart bids, whereby no matter what happens, I'm likely to get something great. And that's the challenge in Albedo, because it's usually a little bit easier to go all in for one planet and then go home for the second. Sometimes that's the right call, but the challenge is in doing well on both planets at once, and Albedo is just a wonderfully tight, compelling package. Yeah, that's what makes the game so great and so short, is because, like you said, it's blind bidding, much like other games we like, like Guardians of Atlantis 2, you're just putting a card face down. You're putting it's not the slow build up like Smash Up or or Blood Bowl Team Manager where you're trying to counter each other back and forth and the game takes forever. You put your whole hand down and there's a divider in there for planet one or planet two. They're flipped over, you resolve it, you're on to the next fight. Deciding how to use multi use cards, which is also something we like to do. Exactly. Much Yeah, much like Scout. You can turn the cards upside down or whatever. They give you different stats, depending on which way you have them turned. Yeah, the iconography isn't great, but it's an indie production. That's the kind of thing that sometimes happens. I agree with you. The, the art is pretty good, but the iconography is not very good. And sometimes that actually leads to confusion. And again, this is one of the cases where I, as the rules explainer, need to do a better job of walking, walking people through it because there have been persistent rules questions. There have been two sets of expansions, meaning there are three different kinds of factions to play. The default human one, the human pirate one, and Yggdrasil, which are kind of the mutated plants. I've played all of them. They're all kind of cool. They all have their neat little thing. And even at the most rules intimidating, which is probably the Yggdrasil faction, it's still very, very approachable. So for a simple, quick, engaging, very portable game, I think Albedo's a winner. It's sadly underappreciated. Albedo. We get to play Anachrony, specifically Anachrony Fractures of Time, and we add it in the Quantum Loops uh, module from Future Imperfect. So Anachrony is a Mind Clash worker placement game designed by David Tsertse with Richard Amon and Victor Peter. And by now, after having two major expansions and a whole bunch of modules, it is very much an, an instantiation of the more is more philosophy of game design. And Anachrony, I think, is one of the rare cases where it kind of works, largely by virtue of how it sells the theme and how that kind of sort of mostly holds everything together. I say mostly. <laughs> it's very much a matter of taste, but I think the stompy mechs can't hurt. And ultimately, the uh, module that we tried, Quantum Loops, I think was a victim of the one deck too many problem. And that is indeed one of the major criticisms we had of Fractures of Time. The Fractures of Time module itself, which is a major expansion, is one we wholeheartedly recommend. The Fractures of Time module is a review copy we got from the publisher, although the base game and everything else is ours. And the Fractures of Time module really doubles down on the time travel because it allows you to warp. Warping is awesome. And it's great, and it's core to the gameplay, and it doesn't feel ancillary, and it makes you feel powerful, and it gives you lots of new options you get to fiddle with a time machine. In the process, it also adds a deck of technologies, which is kind of over there. <laughs> it's that other deck, over there, which maybe you can pay attention to, especially if you're sitting next to it. This is one of the underappreciated elements of board game design. Where are you going to put these extraneous decks? <laughs> yeah, that, there, was a whole, there was a whole episode on it. I love, loved it of uh, Ludology that talk about... You know, your left hand, your right hand, the board yep. space in front of you, all of that stuff. Absolutely. If you can find it, definitely listen to it. And that's very much what these, oh, no, I shouldn't say over heavily complicated games break down for me. It's like, right. I, don't, I don't do this much, this part of the game very often. So I'm going to sit over there this yeah. time. Much like when I talk about Twilight uh, TI4, I like to sit right by the victory point conditions. Good call. And in this case, I like to sit, you know, in part in front of part of the game, which this time was the time traveling, like using the resources in the future, going back and replacing them. And that's what I did. Yeah. I'm willing to tolerate the technology deck in Fractures of Time because warping is so great. It's thematic. It's fun. It leads to interesting tactical and strategic trade-offs. 
Then there was the Quantum Loops module, which was suggested by a patron, and I'm glad to glad to have tried it. Almost all the other modules, Doomsday, Quantum Loop, you, know, you name it, they're fine, and they don't really add too many rules by themselves, but they typically add a deck of cards or two, which means that it's easy to lose sight of it if you're not sitting right next to it. And it's just, you know, one too many notes, as the Archduke of, of Austria might say. Yeah, I can't even think about going back and playing without blinking or warping around. It, it would be very restraining. I'd be happy to do it, honestly. I'm willing to play the, the, the base game. In comparison, it feels restraining on a turn-by-turn basis, but there are more rounds. It takes about roughly the same, same amount of time, but you have more rounds to play rather than more dense rounds. I agree with you that I'd much prefer to play with Fractures of Time, but again, partially because... Anachrony is never clean. <laughs> it's never a clean game, but it is a lot cleaner without Fractures of Time. It also reduces the table presence enormously uh, for the better because you don't have two other extraneous boards to manipulate by virtue of, of, of warping. Anyway, so Anachrony, as it's just a worker placement game. At the end of the day, it's a worker placement game. But there are some conceits thrown in the way of time travel, mostly in the base game that amounts to loans that you repay in the future, literally. And various other modules, like, for example, you, there are modules where you send your mechs out to fight monsters. There are modules where you're trying to prevent the end of the world. There are these that, And they're all fine, like I say. But other than Fractures of Time, I think they're all easily forgettable. I've never really felt the need to go back to any of them other than Fractures of Time. It's definitely a game that just will, will play better if you play it more often. Yes, this is a crowded, surprisingly crowded field, you know? Uh, rather sprawling... Euro games that last about two and a half to three hours usually. And normally that's the kind of thing where I have very, very, very high standards. And in my collection, there is only a small number of games that I'm willing to hold on to that fall into that category. And Anachrony is one of them. Part Again, part of it is the theming, but part of it is the core elements of scoring points and going out and achieving your objectives is relatively straightforward compared to a lot of the other stuff. The extraneous stuff tends not to poison the centrality of figuring out how to get where you want to go. There's a lot that's daunting, but very seldom, like in a lot of other games, you can say, so how do I score points? What am I doing here? So that's something to be said in Anachrony's favor. It's true, yeah. Right off the offset, you're given a faction. It'll tell you when the end of the world happens, this is what you need to do, and that way you have a goal and you start heading towards that right in turn one. Absolutely. Anachrony. That is anachrony, specifically Fractures of Time, also Future Imperfect. We got to play a game called Trudvang Legends. True Trudvang Legends? I do not know how to pronounce it. This is designed by Jordi Aden, Fel Barros, Gilmer Gulhart. Eric M. Lang, and a bunch of others. Lots of people. Marco Maggi, Francesco Nep- Nepalatello, Umberto Pignatelli, and Fabio Tola. It's a lot of people to fit in one room. Well, look, there's a fair amount of writing, and it is one of, one of my frustrations, actually, with games like Legacy of Dragonhold, is that I'm not exactly sure if all the writers are credited with uh, game design credits. At least I get the impression that in Trinidad and Legends, they spent a little bit more of an effort to try to acknowledge as many people as they could. True. This is the newest Simon Kickstarter that just fulfilled, and it is a bag builder. It's very interesting. I, I very much enjoyed our single play. I'm looking forward to going back to it. I played sort of like the the drinking monk, I guess you could say. He was a bard. His, his, his class title drinking is bard. bard. It has a feeling of room bound, right? Where you're not you're not breaking out like a separate map when a fight happens. You're not you're not populating anything you just say these are your enemies in this particular area of the map and then you start fighting them out and i think it has a very interesting sort of mini orleans type thing where you're putting out three of your actions that you can do it's random out of your deck four four things sorry four things that are your deck you reach into your bag and you start pulling out tokens there's a little bit of push your luck there too because if you pull out so many negative results you're just going to whiff on the attack and well, it's, it's actually more interesting than that. It's not that you whiff on the attack. It's that after you say you're done pulling tokens, you are either going to activate your bennies on the track, nothing on the track if you pulled slightly more misses than that, or activate all the demerits on your track. And as a consequence, that opens up the design space for adding and removing benefits and, and detriments on that track as a kind of way to get buffs and debuffs onto a given character. So I came in to Trudbag Legends with zero expectations. 
it was supposed to have fulfilled two years ago, and I was never particularly enthusiastic at the time. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I was in the yeah, sure, whatever phase of some campaign Kickstarter campaign backing. I'm well past that. I don't ever do yeah, sure, whatever for campaign backing. But I kept getting updates, and about a over a year ago, they said, well, we've come to the conclusion that the game we have isn't very fun, so we're starting over. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I'd keep getting updates. My eyes would glaze over. I wouldn't read the updates. So I came in with zero expectations. None. I really like the combat system. I don't know if I like what they've done with it. It's the first encounter. It's stuff to tell another campaign system. More on that later. But you have this interesting opportunity with both how you build your bag, how you build your track, and how you build the cards that you're activating with your chit pulls and deciding how much you're willing to risk. The problem that I've encountered so far is that my two upgrades that I've done, I've leveled up twice over the course of, of one adventure. And both of the upgrades didn't fundamentally change the color of token I was looking for. So as a consequence, I'm not encouraged to go out and build my bag creatively. In a game like Hyperborea or in a game like Orléans, the other bag builders that we really, really like, you're encouraged to be conscientious about what colors to expand into. You get new buildings, you get new action spaces that call for different colors. And so you have to start managing this ecosystem of your, of your bag. So far, I'm not really getting that. You don't want the bad results, that's for sure, but you just mostly want the same colors you've always wanted. And Yeah, it just seems very random, and it doesn't... Yeah, I see yeah. what you're saying, yes. Yeah, and so if they start doing more with that, if our character upgrades open up a little bit, or if the parameters start opening up a little bit more in terms of managing our track of, of buffs and debuffs, I don't know. There's a lot to like. I also like how gentle a hand they've had with the overall campaign elements so far. It's, you know, read a couple paragraphs, not a couple pages, and then you go do a couple rounds of combat, which are relatively straightforward. Then a couple paragraphs, then a couple rounds of par uh, of combat. It's very snappy. It doesn't feel like I'm l drowning under a whole bunch of different boxes. Everything is within one box. It's a, it's a big box game, but everything you need is there. It's not drowning in extraneous stuff. Now, this is partially because none of the stretch goals have shipped yet, but I did take a look. The stretch goals consist of self-contained campaigns, so they can just be left off to the side, and some new characters. Maybe then we'll start having component creep, but, but quite frankly, after having spent years of games of this ilk going overboard with text and overboard with... I like tactical combat systems, right? But it was a little bit of a fresh air, as you say, to have something where it was abstracted to the level where it's like, okay, well, we're just doing this bag building thing that represents combat, and it's a very quick back and forth. I thought I thought the pacing was wonderful. Yeah, and they did they did a extensive work or a lot of work into the players being able to stop whenever they wanted and, yeah. and the progress being saved at any time. Everything is sort of put into these sleeves, not only on sideboards, but even on the main board has sleeves and you can simply put whatever your character thing stuff is into your bag, put it in the box and, and you're ready for your next, your next play. Even the fundamental round structure is just represented by cards that you put in sleeves on the main board. These aren't freestanding sleeves. They're more like pockets, kind of like the screen in Mysterium. You just slide them in, and there you go. When your, your, your game is done, you fold up the main board, and all the stuff that you've done on an app is just saved there. Yeah, I would happily go back to it. I'm kind of interested to see if it plays a little bit more with the combat system, which I already find interesting, but I, I'm hopeful that they open it up a little bit more to make the strategic horizons more interesting. But I came in with, with uh, even a sense of fatigue around true vague legends. And I, I f left feeling refreshed and, and having enjoyed it. Well, there's a little limit there, right? Because, because you only get to draw four cards. And in these other games that we talked about, there are a plethora of more actions where the variety of tokens you're going to get, you're, you are going to be able to do something that you want. Whereas when you're limited to just that is four, true. maybe it's going to be a little more difficult for you to give you this more play in your bag. Sure. That's a good point. Anyway, I'm, I suffice to say, I'm curious to see what they do with it, and I find the core systems to be strong. That is Trudvang Legends. We got to play a game called Long Shot the Dice Game. This is designed by Chris Handy and published by Perplexed. And you roll some dice, Mark, and the horses run. And you get to pull along some horses. You get to use the die that decides which horse is moving to do a plethora of of other things, either modify that horse's card, put a hat on the jockey or a jacket on the jockey, which is going to get you to do yeah, other things. A lot of focus on haberdashery. You could, uh, there's all sorts of the sort of little mini roll and write games going on on various boards. I don't know if I agree. 
Uh, part of what makes Longshot the dice game refreshing to me is that it's not really much of a roll and write. There's one aspect which screams roll and write, and that is there's a grid of numbers, and if you fill in rows or columns, you get a Benny. Classic roll and write, no objection there. But the rest of it mostly has to do with betting on and buying horses. And so it didn't feel a lot like a roll and write to me most of the time. It felt a lot more like a classic Reiner Kiditsi game called Winner's Circle. I love me some Winner's Circle. And Longshot the Dice Game was definitely giving me vibes of that. You can try to use your abilities to make whatever horses you've bet on do better. You can even buy horses. And there's a substantial benefit for doing that. That is the one part of the game where I have some doubts. You get a huge payout if your horse manages to finish. But it seems like a lot of the horses got bought really early. I don't know if this is just an experience. I think that maybe with more experienced players, you wait longer to buy horses, maybe. And so then you have a slightly better shot of going of what's going on. If there's a rush on buying horses, you're probably going to pick one semi-randomly, and there's no way to tell that early on which horses have to do well. Because, you know, there's still a fair amount of randomness. Yeah, true. Like I said, like you said, it could be something that you do later on in the in the game. And we almost first turn bought horses. It's like we have all this money burning holes in our pocket. It's never going to run out. We've got to buy a horse. <laughs> yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I think for if you're going to do a roll and write game with this kind of betting, you want to have some ability to mitigate the luck, which you do. You have the ability to have horses drag along your preferred horses. You should have a variety of things to do with your cash if you're going to involve that, which you do. And there should be moments of delight and tension when you see a horse rush ahead. And, you know, there, there, there's a fundamental, as much as we complain about randomness in games, there is a fundamental thrill to just being able to roll and move when you feel that there are some stakes on the line. And for a game of this length, I'm certainly willing to forgive Longshot the dice game its swings of fate. There are a lot of people who swear up and down that Longshot, the, the original game, is also good. I have never played it. But then there are also a lot of people who say that the dice game is the superior version. It's an adorable production. Very, very minimalistic, but nonetheless with a lovely little cartoonish flair. And I am very much looking forward to going back to Longshot the Dice Game. I got to introduce Walker to Hanabi. Hanabi is the co-op deduction game by Antoine Bozo, one of our favorite designers. And it's one of those many games where you're not allowed to speak. And people talk all the time about how they win all the damn time. And I suspect it's because they're cheating. Because I've seen the way people play Hanabi hardcore. Hanabi is definitely one of those games where if you play online, you had best be ready to be a sweaty tryhard. Because there are people who are going to tell you over and over that you're playing wrong because you're not playing by the universally acknowledged conventions that just exist in the ether surrounding Hanabi. And at a certain point, I start to question whether that's in even the letter of the rules, let alone the spirit of the rules. But... Nonetheless, I feel like every game of Hanabi is, to a certain extent like the Resistance, entering into a new logic puzzle whose parameters change by virtue of who else is at the table. And I never get tired of watching people make inferences, make clever clues, watching a clever clue pay off, even watching someone not get a clever clue, watching that person usually is me. And the the thrills and the tension, it's, it's a really, really solid game. It stood the test of time. It was originally published over 10 years ago. And I'm surprised it's taken us this long to put it in front of Walker's face. What did you think of it? I enjoyed it. Now that I remember we did play two games. I was going to say it was a bit long, but now that I remember we played two games in a row. so We did. Not too, too bad. I really enjoyed it. I did play uh, the Sherlock Holmes version quite a few years ago. Ah, uh, Yes. So that, I, that shares the conceit whereby everyone can see your hand of cards but you. Correct. So I did have a little bit of feel to it. And like you said, it has this sort of bridge feeling to it that if you have a group that plays it a lot, they might get these inner sort of workings. Right. And like even you said, I'm always going to draw on my right and, and the one that I'm probably going to discard will always be on my left type thing. And that is a little bit of this, you know, not within the rules, might be within the rules, but right, we're right. going to manipulate what we do I just to... In my defense, I was half trying to give you a glimpse of the wider world of Hanabi. No, 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 I understood that. No, I, I knew it was... I, I understood exactly what you're doing. Like, this is like you're... And even when you said that, this is... You said this is... This is kind of this cheating, This is kind but... of what people do. Yeah, and, and yeah. These are the yeah. inferences people make in order to get these high scores, because they're all a bunch of cheaters. <laughs> it's not what I said. I know. <laughs> I am aware. <laughs> I have on occasion, though, seen people who say, oh, yeah, Hanabi, we get to 25 points all the time. Because Hanabi is the kind of game where, kind of like Regicide, it is very, very difficult to, quote-unquote, win. But in Hanabi, what winning means varies. Because 
getting to 25 is an absolute win, but mostly getting past 20 is, is a win in my book, or even the high teens. As opposed to regicide, where that's getting to the kings may be an accomplishment, but you've still lost if you don't kill the final king. I've heard a number of people talk about how easy Hanabi is and how they get to 25 all the time. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. I'd very much like to see how you do it, because I'm just curious. I, I find it very difficult to get to 25. And I watch them play, and it's it's like... That you realize you can play however you want, but you realize that the rules say you're not allowed to do that. It's like, oh yeah, yeah whatever. It's like, okay. <laughs> Again, if you get to, tw- I'm not. If you get to 25 all the time, I'm not saying you're cheating. I'm just saying I've seen it happen. That's all. So that is Hanabi by Antoine Boza. It's probably my favorite cooperative deduction game. Even better than things like Paint the Roses. Even better than the the Sherlock Holmes one. Those are all solid games, but Hanabi is still my favorite. I, we will have to agree to disagree. I got to go back to G.I. Joe, the deck building game, which the original was a review copy, but I picked up the expansion, which is called The Shadow of the Serpent. And this is great because you have the Joe Command Center now, just like in the (laughs) animated show, you have this giant console that has, has multiple tiles. And I think this sort of semi addresses problems that Mark might have had with the game where you have no choice. It's like, well, I have this much money, you know, buying this Joe is the next obvious choice and doing this. Well, now you can pool your money. So like instead of, so before you had to make some tough choices of whether you're going to send Joe's when it's not your turn to help other people out. Now you have the choice whether to spend your money when it's not your turn to help by the command center parts because the command center, everyone is allowed to pool their money out of turn in order to buy these pieces. There are also cards added to the deck that also have this new symbol that people are allowed to pool their money. So adds a little bit more choice, a little more, you know, do I, am I going to wait? Not, I shouldn't say waste your turn, but sort of very much influence your turn because you don't get to draw until the end of your turn. I felt that one of the big thematic deficits of the G.I. Joe deck building game is that it didn't accurately represent the importance of investment that you saw in the cartoon. I see what you're saying. I'm just joking. I thought that the <laughs> I thought the base game was perfectly fine thematically, but in terms of gameplay, very, very much wanting. But, you know, that that is a difficult tightrope. Will the expansion be able to satisfy any of the gameplay complaints I had while still feeling like a giant excuse for toys? I suspect the answer might well be yes. I couldn't help but notice, though, I commented that when the G.I. Joe deck building game was released, I was surprised that it wasn't designed by Matt Hira, because Matt Hira is the guy you hire to do themed deck building games. And who has designed the expansion? None other than Matt Hira. So there you go. It's true. And it was different. The designer of the original G.I. Joe deck building game was T.C. Petty III. Both of them were put out by Renegade Game Studios. Played another game of The Mirroring of Mary King. This is the latest release by Jim Felly of D.V. Sweezel Games. Two-player only card economy action combo driving tile flipping spatial thing. I still can't get over the fact, I keep saying this, that it's a small game box with an apron mat. I don't know how he did it. It's a miracle. And I find Mary King is really growing on me more and more, and it's winning friends everywhere that it goes. This is probably one of Jim Felly's most approachable designs in terms of rules load, and it's got a lovely graphical presence in terms of flipping the tiles, and that just lends it on sort of an obvious thematic heft about the fight of consciousness between Mary King and a ghost trying to possess her. And I'm really appreciating as well the possibility that the action cards open up and how you get to do cool turns. A lot of these games don't let you do cool turns, where at the end of it, it's like, I have done an impressive thing. And I did the combo that triggered a whole bunch of stuff without it being overburdened by rules or legacy knowledge or large quantities of downtime. And so I think that the... The Mirroring of Mary King has really walked this tightrope really well, and it's one of my favorite two-player filler-length games, I've got to say, certainly of the past five to ten years. It's done a really, really good job, and like everything else, every Jim Felly game feels utterly unlike everything else on the market. <laughs> so, And so, like, different than all of his other games as well. Not absolutely, just, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And so this is a review copy I got. Uh, we got from the publisher. And also, full disclosure, I did a few playtest sessions, although I will mention again, I'm the worst playtester in the history of ever, in that after a playtest session, I'm usually able to muster, eh, uh, uh, that's, just, that's actually I, that's actually verbatim what I yeah, said. Yeah, I think they put that on the Kickstarter page, didn't they? <laughs> exactly. So that's The Mirroring of Mary King from Jim Felly. I highly recommend it if you're in the market for quick two-player games. Those are the games we played last week, and now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Mark, we are going to be at Shucks this coming weekend. 
starting September 30th to October 2nd in sunny Vancouver. At least that's what, what the the weather app says. It will be sunny while we're there. Stop lying, Walker. This will totally change, I am sure. We have two events there, so if you're in the area, come and check it out. It warmed the cockles of my heart, Walker, to see that on the organized play geek list for Shucks, there were a large number of people clamoring to sign up for Games of Tigers and Euphrates, the copy of the game that you generously gifted to the Shucks Library. And all of those people, some of whom have never played Tigers and Euphrates before, but whose response was, ooh, I'd love to be able to play for the first time, will be exposed to, in my estimation, the greatest game ever made by virtue of your largesse. I, I, that is my whole goal, Mark. Glad to see it coming to fruition. And I like to see all the people that are signing up for your Sudiro Confluence game. That That's exciting, too. Yeah, we're going to play a game of Sudiro Confluence on Friday. I possibly will have been able to sleep prior to that. We'll see. Perhaps some of my deals will be very strange. Maybe I'll just be uh, the, the, the Zeth and threaten people in an incoherent way. It's like, I think you should give me all of your cubes or something bad's going to happen. Then I'll fall asleep and then I'll fail to <laughs> fall through. You wake up, there'll be a puddle of drool with floating counters. Where'd all my cubes go? <laughs> they'll just be... And a strewn over yep. sidereal confluence and the table will be empty. And the Yangi eye will just shake their heads and say, monsters. I'm and surrounded be, by there'll monsters. there'll be a post-it note to your head saying, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> Shucks. Shucks. <laughs> Mark, we stream stuff. If you want to, if you liked our conversation about Anachrony, well, check out our live channel on YouTube. You can watch us play that particular game of Anachrony. You know, someone showed up on the chat during our play of Anachrony and accused us of misplaying a role. And uh, no, we were playing it right. I felt aggrieved. Oh. They accused us of, of under-costing the removal of anomalies. But no, we were doing it correct. I will say, though, just as, as a final coda to our comments about Anachrony, the reason why we were using a different component just to represent the costs of getting rid of anomalies is because I didn't feel like finding the other custom sideboard <laughs> to put out next to the boards that you're supposed to <laughs> when you're playing with Fractures of Time. I talked about Space Dwarves before. Mark, you know how Warhammer 40k is adding dwarf Space Dwarves back in? Squats, yeah, squats as it yeah, were? Yeah. I thought it would just be a unit or two, but Foolish me, That's summer child army. that I am. Oh, yes. New faction, yeah. Oh, three different types of tribes and oh, oh yeah, wow. the full deal. But that being said, they're very interesting looking. If you have any interest at all, I would suggest going to the Games Workshop site. I'm sure Mark will put the link that I've provided to him in the show notes. Oh, really? Just, you want me to provide a link to the like, Games Workshop does not need us to shill for them, Walker. Just check out the pictures. I don't, I, I just like <laughs> looking at some of the pictures. I okay. don't buy any stuff for them. Okay. Mark, we've played Fuse. Did you enjoy Fuse? King Clanko has done a whole bunch of real-time dice games. Fuse was probably one of my least preferred of his efforts. But I do like a lot of his work. Well, they're coming out with a new Fuse. It's going to be called Fuse Countdown. And not only is it a standalone and an expansion, I very much enjoyed Fuse. So I am looking forward to checking this out. I just prefer other King Clanko real-time dice games. That's all. I think his Pandemic game was really good. That's the news. Rapid response. And that's why it doesn't matter. Now onto our topic, which is what a campaign needs. So, as I've said several times, this episode even, it is the era of campaigns. And we've definitely now been in a position to comment on the kinds of things we want in a campaign and the kind of things we don't want in a campaign. I want to start off with things that are called campaigns, but are not really campaigns. Okay. How about, like, the crew, the you know, the trick-taking game, The Crew. Ah, uh, yes. It claims to have a campaign. Yes, it does. Pure marketing. <laughs> Pure marketing. <laughs> it's a scenario. Yeah. Any game that used to have just here are a whole bunch of different scenarios, there's now this marketing pressure to pretend as though it's a series of linked adventures or something. Yeah, and there's a, a bunch of them. And some of them have uh, some things that link them together, but they're so minimal that it's it, that it's laughable. Like Shards of Infinity. Yes. Uh, you know, they say, here's an upgraded card. Instead of doing, you know, three fight, you're doing four fight. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Now, the mechs, mechs, mechs versus minions, like when I was doing research in this, mechs versus, versus minions kept coming up. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what What are they talking about, campaign system? In a way, I guess you could say, you know, it had the different. It was you know, one of the most obnoxious elements of mechs versus minions. I, I really think it was. Like opening those envelopes and worrying about 
keeping track of yeah and you didn't need to do that it just added this extra component load that could have been sorted differently and, absolutely and made way more sense absolutely just have a bunch of scenarios play the scenarios you want tell people that the, the amount of components goes up generally speaking with the number of the scenario the only virtue you got out of the quote unquote campaign system was i will grant you there's that large hidden box and the reveal is kind of impressive but past that ugh just, but but that's that's the difference, right? Neither of those were really campaigns or didn't feel very campaigny. In the crew, it's just spin and you can completely ignore it. Play whichever scenario you want. Play them in reverse order. What do you care? As opposed to Mechs versus Minions, where the attempts to have campaign trappings made the game physically more painful to deal with. Agreed. Figuratively, not literally. I didn't get paper cuts or anything like that. No, that's true. So my first point is... It says here, let's get on with it. And we've talked about this before (laughs) is, you know, they either make this first scenario too boring and they don't show you the toys you're going to get. They don't show you what you're in for. They don't, you know, show you the world that they're going to. Have I seen the game? Yeah. 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 Or, or they, they goes on, on and on like so many, like, okay, slow progression. It's like, oh, it's like how many hours do I have to put in before, you know, something interesting is going to happen? Yeah. Get on with it. A lot of this, I think this is the first instantiation of a sort of general principle that will capture a lot of this, which is, why are you turning this into a commitment? Why are you turning my hobby into more of a commitment than it already is? There are lots... Look, I'm I'm not saying that I'm afraid of commitment or anything like that. There are lots of commitments that, that are already necessarily involved in these kinds of group social endeavors, right? It's not a commitment for enterprise. Why are you in a box giving me more bits of commitment? And if I don't know whether the first scenario is actually as good as the game gets... I'm not in a position to make an intelligent choice about whether I want to play it a second time. This is not just because we're reviewers and we have a large amount of turn. This is because time is limited, your friend's patience is limited, and there's lots of demands for your attention. I don't know whether I want to go to a second play of this, that, or the other versus another round of Aliens Fireteam Elite or any other number of things that I could be doing with my time. And the fact that so many games, so many games, the first scenario is a waste of time, angers me deeply. That being said, there can be some sort of like a sort of like a because it falls into the same thing, like a a weight on you, knowing that there's so much like something like a sure like a Reichbusters, where you know there's only like ten missions or or sixteen missions, whereas when you look in the Gloomhaven book, it says scenario ninety nine, <laughs> and that's just what comes in the base game. Never mind the you know I think probably ninety nine other scenarios that were put online and other places. This I think is is where you can use expansions judiciously, right? If the campaigns are say 10ish scenarios long like you say in Reichbusters, well that's just a great opportunity to sell expansions. And it's a great way to make sure because I, I look, I don't think you could quibble. We can have different standards of value, but I don't think one could seriously quibble about an expansion that adds a, a, a new 10 scenario campaign onto a campaign game system, right? And I think that so, so Reichbusters does that. I get the solid impression that that's more or less the model that Tridvank Legends has. A lot of the expansion material for the Kickstarter were these standalone expansion modules. And I get the sense that it proceeds at a reasonably good clip. But yeah, the, like Gloomhaven. Again, if I were to encounter Gloomhaven again, say in a frosty version, I honestly don't know that there are, you know, three digits worth of scenarios is an asset or a detriment. Like, I'm just going to feel intimidated. It seems strange to complain about extra value. But by the same token, there's a certain virtue and a sense of completion. And I I, I, I never completed the, the core Gloomhaven campaign. I got tons of value out of the box, but, you know. Yeah, and I have this point much further down, but I think it ties in here better different game modes so imperial salt does this where you can play a skirmish game with what you have and you can also play a campaign so if if one player in the group if one player in the group really enjoys it then they get to play that over and over again and get more out of that box where if it's just the campaign then you have all this stuff sitting around and it's locked into this one sort of mode that you have one of the things that stars of Akarios promised and never delivered was a raid mode whereby you could just set up a scenario and play a standalone scenario. You get to play with different toys. You get to experiment with different configurations and you wouldn't have to go through. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more later, later, the awful writing and the distractions from the space combat. When we thought that the base engine of the space combat was kind of cool, but everything around surrounding the campaign elements were just torturous and painful. 
with a raid system, maybe we'd have a reason to go back to Stars of Icarus. This is one of the things that uh, very early on when talking with Gordon Clay in Fate Forge, and one of the reasons why I'm pledging for Fate Forge, it's going to have not a raid mode, but it's just going to have a battle mode. It's like, you don't you don't want to do a campaign? Fine. Here's, here's just a fight. Just go do a fight. That's it. And especially if it's going to be app-driven, I don't support app being app-driven. This is one of my other beef with campaigns. But if you're going to have an app, a companion app of any kind, let it spit out challenging random battle missions, either for the people who don't have the time or the inclination, or just for people who just want to see if they want to commit to the campaign to begin with. Yeah, and Reichbusters had that as well. Three different ways you could play. Full campaign also had just a quick, you know, draw three cards. You're on this raid. These are the characters you get. These yep. are the upgrades you get. Off you go. Yeah. It's, I mean, this kind of flexibility is one of the areas in which Oathsworn really shines. Now, we haven't gotten past the first scenario in Oathsworn. Walker has serious misgivings about the battle system, and I have overall con- uh, questions about how the thing is going to adapt. But the fundamental structure of Oathsworn, I think, and I think I'm going to have a- occasion to repeat this several times, gets almost everything exactly right. In that, you want to skip the story bits? Fine. A few pages is going to be replaced by a couple paragraphs, and instead of choices, you're just going to get handed out some random bennies. Want to swap people? Want to swap characters? Want to swap number of people playing? Fine, go ahead. Want to start at scenario 10? Go ahead. It just doesn't put burdens in front of you, and it's the epitome of, and in fact, broadens the statement that you started with, the get on with it. You can play it however way you want. It doesn't have to be a burden if you don't want it to be. You're going to be wrestling with a thousand components, the way a lot of campaign games are, but you get to play it the way you want it to rather than it deciding to drop its pearls of goodness at the rate that it seems fit to do. All right, before we get into the standard campaign, let's keep going with these odd sort of campaign systems. Let's talk about taking a standard game and just sort of tacking on a campaign system. We're talking things like Scythe and Maracaibo and sort of Massive Darkness, like the first the first edition, it sort of it was sort of no, it had it had a it did have a campaign system, but it was it was sort just of, bad. It was sort of pushed on by the backers. Oh, they I had, see. They I hadn't see, planned I see. on it. It's not sort of fall into that thing, but so in Scythe, it came out as a standard board game, and then the the very last expansion that came out with they made it so you could uh, have a mini campaign. And from what I remember, it was it wasn't terrible. It wasn't great. It was all right, yeah, but it was all right. I'm somewhat curious, uh, a more recent example of this is how they managed the system for Dead Reckoning, the the saga system, they say. The games aren't really thematically connected. You're not building on past successes, but new cards enter the system based on previous playing. So people can jump in and jump out. It's not really a full campaign. It, it's kind of like what Oath was trying to do. And again, Oath is, is another example of this kind of maybe a campaign, maybe not. And I still don't have a good sense of whether I buy its campaign elements, but that's just me. <laughs> All right. So standard campaign systems. All players must buy into it to make it interesting. I know this is not on the designers, but they do have to make room for this to happen, that you interact with each other, bounce off each other, sort of combo with each other, that everyone in the group is sort of participating at the same time. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you're driving at. Well, that, that everyone feels important. You know what I mean? That, you know, that all ah. that's all balanced, that there's sort of room for people to interact with each other, that, you know, there, everyone matters. Sure. Or you give people the flexibility to swap in and out of various roles. You know, again, the example being you're, lo- you're, you're, you're locked into something from the start of the campaign until the very end. The extreme example of, of incredible free-flowing flexibility is something like Oathsworn. I was actually reasonably pleased with how flexible Gloomhaven was in terms of swapping characters. You could swap characters and have new people come in and leave. And, you know, the average level more or less took care of that. But I agree with you. Far too many campaigns lock people in, and you discover that the ca- the character isn't your choice, and suddenly you're just set, uh, stuck playing second fiddle. All right, you have to have invested interest not only in the game but in the story and in your character. You need to be like immersed in the world. Absolutely. Can you think of recent examples that have done a good job of that? I think Grail was the last time we played that. I had any sort of invested interest in a character. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, uh, other than uh, Dragonhold for me, I've been I've been going back to Dragonhold. That's that's a different kind of campaign. And again, I probably would enjoy it less if I weren't playing it solo. Uh, but yeah, Tainted Grail was a good example. Again, I, I I'm most of the games that I've really enjoyed. Dragonhold's an exception. So there's Oathsworn. I've liked the writing. Tainted Grail. I've liked the writing. I've strongly disliked the writing of Stars of Icarus, and I. I I'm mostly indifferent to the writing of most of the other ones that we've bounced up across. And I, I, 
the one thing that those two have in common is that they're sort of dark fallen worlds in which you're you're scrabbling against poorly understood forces that are out to get you. I don't know if that's what ma- makes me like them. It's just it certainly at least gives them a little more personality than the mostly generic stuff you encounter a lot of the time. Yeah, that's a point I have later on. Like we've always said, you're the B team. You're not the center of the main story. You're sort of like the offshoot. There's like all sorts of exciting stuff happening. <laughs> you're sort of on the outskirts. And I really enjoy that kind of thing. Tainted Grail. Imperial Salt does it in an interesting way because they have a balance to sort of maintain. That they, they, People want the main characters in the game. They want the Han Solo. They want the Luke yep. Skywalker. And I know I understand that you're a complaint that there is this vast universe, but people want it sort of tied into the story. So instead well, of... That's just what it is to tell. Look, yes. setting my complaints aside, what it is to tell a Star Wars story yes. is indelibly touched by a small number... Okay, so, sorry. A certain number of people showing up or implicated on the reg. That's just what it is to tell Star Wars stories. Yeah, and I think they do a great job of it because you don't get to play those characters, but it, like in the middle of a mission... One of them will like sort of scoot out of an alley and say, "Hey, I need your help," and you'll <laughs> and you'll you'll like sort of have a side mission off with them, yep. and then you know you'll go off on your normal on your normal missions. I think I I I think for that particular genre, I think they did a great job. It's tough. It's kind of a known situation. This is one area where I'm kind of agnostic as to how a campaign should run itself. If you create compelling characters who are NPCs, like really really impressive NPCs, you run the risk of making people wish that they could play as them. There was a there was an example of in video game development. This is a long time ago. This was PS One uh, video game development. There was this Bruce Willis licensed game called Apocalypse, where Bruce Willis was initially going to be your wingman, your, your your sort of player two following you. But then they realized people wanted to be Bruce Willis. Like they were spending all this energy on AI and trying to make sure him operating. But even after they brought him in to record the lines and, and captures like this, they're like, no, people want to be Bruce Willis. So then they had to change the whole thing, <laughs> and it's hard. In the context of narrative, in the almost obligatory flavor text that accompanies all this stuff, to have your characters, you know, speak and do things, right? Because then that, that's kind of taking agency away from you. That's where I think a lot of it rests on on mechanical elements to make your character feel distinct and plausible given their role. The graphical elements where you're like, this, this person looks really cool and distinctive and I want to be that person. A, a lot can go that way. And then, of course, there's the... Uh, the ability to customize your character in a more functional way. That's how Legacy of Dragonhold does it. You know, I think one of the reasons why I identify so strongly with my Legacy of Dragonhold character, not identify with, but I appreciate the character in my Legacy of Dragonhold story is I have an explanation for why he's able to do what he's able to do. And that level of customization allowed me the personalization to really appreciate what he was doing. Yeah, I have that. Later on, evolving character... Uh, like things you're going to look forward to. I, I enjoy games that sort of give you the skill deck and you can sort of, well, this is the path I'm going to take and mm. this I can see oh, I'm going to be able to get to this finally or, you know, your character slowly gets better over time. Yeah, the rate of character advancement is also really tricky. It can't be too fast. It can't be too slow. And and it helps if there's a lot of different axes upon which you can develop. And again, you know, Gloomhaven does a great job of this. So I think does, based on the structure that I've read, which is very transparent of Oathsworn, you're always going to get something. Seldom is it the case that you're going to finish an adventure and it's just like, well... A few more like that and I'll level up. It's, you know, you get a check mark here towards your battle goals. You get a, a little bit more money that you can immediately cash in for something. It's a hard balance to strike. And to be, to be frank, I'm usually relatively pleased at the pacing of new stuff. All right. My next point is great story, which we sort of touched on. Very clear goals. You know, you're not sort of fumbling around in the dark. Yes. Um, and linked missions. So one of the things with respect to, you know, good story is the framing matters a lot. You talked about how, how much you appreciate being the B team. But one of the things that I really hated about Stars of Akarios was how the fighter pilots were just making these weird decisions. They were telling with the fleet where to go. They were deci- making diplomatic decisions about who to, uh, with whom to ally in a civil war with alien right? It just made zero sense. And it just indicated that they, they were too sloppy to figure it out, or they didn't care about the universe, or they assumed that the players wanted to be the masters of everything. I mean, a different framing would have made everything more grounded and probably given me a better a, a reason to care about my character rather than just abstracting everything away. And so, I, I don't like some elements of framing are very specific. Like some people don't want to be the B team; they want to be the A team. I I rather appreciate the B team; it's a change of pace. But setting that aside, framing can make all the difference in the world. Choices. 
and or success or failing having repercussions like you know yes. success manipulates the story or have, having you fail a mission and not always just have to well try again or oh, or try lose again. a hit point and the same thing happens anyway yeah yeah yes exactly so having having a fail tree go down a, a different path maybe eventually looping back to where you would have got anyway but at least something or you know your success actually changing the outcome of the game absolutely i think one of the best examples of this was the king's dilemma the king's dilemma there was no failure you could make bad decisions. You could make terrible decisions. Awful things could happen to you, but they all had policy implications. It was never that, oh, well, you know, that grinds to a halt because you failed your perception check, or no, nope, try again because you just muffed it. No, it was, well, you made a call. It was the wrong call pretty clearly, but you have to live with that, sit there and deal with the consequences, which very few campaigns do. Usually it's a, oh, well, lose two health, then go to the same success paragraph or try again. Yeah, or there's games like... Like Adventures of Robin Hood, where you know, if you did choice B, your hidden uh, base would be on the bottom of the board in the next mission, or it would be on the top of the board <laughs> next mission. So, like these things that make no right. difference whatsoever. The right. worst, I think, was Charterstone. Right? It's like, oh, next <sighs> game you start with an apple instead of a pumpkin, and <laughs> the king winked at you this time. I completely. What does that mean? Who knows? I completely forgot about Charterstone. I've completely blanked it from my memory. Oh my goodness. Uff. <laughs> Uff, indeed. On the topic of an inconsequential campaign system married to an inconsequential work replacement game. Oh, my goodness. Charterstone. Oh, dear Lord. A whole world to explore, Mark. That's what a good campaign system needs. A sense of, you know, that there's so much more out there that, you know, you know the galaxy is the limit. There's, like, different places you can go that you're not stuck in, like, a linear you know, story that there is ways for you to break out and have choices there. I, I half agree with you. The sense of agency and the sense of opportunity, I absolutely agree with. That's important. But I think that you can do a lot with lots of scope and a lot with a little scope. So, for example, again, going back to a couple of campaigns that are still kind of sort of ongoing, as far as I'm concerned, one of them being Oathsworn. I, we have no idea what's going to happen in Scenario 2, in part because there are all these boxes with hidden stuff everywhere. Like, we don't even know what they look like. After punching out Gloomhaven, I had some sense of, uh, of idea about the kinds of things that might happen. Some vague sense. But Oath Swarm, I've got no clue whatsoever. But... The sense of scope, it's kind of like that A team, B team thing. Some people want a massive universe to explore or a massive world, and some people like small, narrow stories. I'm the freak who likes Dragon Age 2 and thinks that Dragon Age 2 was a mastercraft of storytelling because it was limited and focused. One family, one city, this is what they're dealing with. Similarly, in Dragonhold, what I love about Legacy of Dragon, it's just this one town. You're a dude or a dudette in a town, and you're getting to know the people there, and you're dealing with some events that, that directly impact the town, and mostly it's just a very, very small, tight scale. And that really, I think, gives an opportunity for things to breathe and for relationships to matter and all those other things. No, but it gives you the, the feeling that there is a, a whole other world out there. But it's a small one. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequential, meaningful world, but it's a small, narrow, focused one. And that, that's the difference that I wanted to highlight. Leaving the door open for a little bit of role play. What yes. comes to mind is like sort of our season zero of of a uh, pandemic. Yes. <laughs> Where there's all, you know, you make, you make all these sort of silly stories and they sort of like, sometimes they almost like come true. You know what I mean? Like weird things happen in the game that tie into the silliness that you've, you know, sort of progressed along the way. And it makes these, you know, sessions that much more enjoyable. Well, that was an example of what I was talking about, how the components can do an awful lot of work. I didn't like Pandemic Season Zero very much, but one of the things that I thought was great was how you make these fake passports and you play with stickers to make your character and you make your aliases later on. It was marvelous. And that allowed us to give a lot of personality to the people that was going, going on. And I think it really sold the universe in the same way that, you know, sometimes it's a well-done miniature. Sometimes it's uh, a, an interesting notion of a profession. Sometimes it's just a cool character portrait. But that, I think, really led into a whole bunch of the, the role-play silliness that we started to adopt. Some of it was based on the writing. Like, we, we developed this strange infatuation. Well, not infatuation. But this this elaborate enthusiasm for, for Agent Cooper. We called him Coop. We... Invented weird backstories about Coop and what he did in Prague in 58. You know, a whole bunch of other stuff. We do that often with lots of games, but I think what gave us the permission to do that or the encouragement to do that in Pandemic Season Zero was, hey, here are some stickers. Go have fun. Exactly. 
And they sort of hinted around that there was stuff going on in the background, right? Which just prodded us into doing that kind of thing. Well, it was just the backdrop of, of no, the Cold yeah, War. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, yeah, sometimes a historical setting will do the work. I mean, the same thing was true of a quite, not quite a campaign, um, Vienna connection, right? It was just four mysteries and they weren't really connected substantially in a campaign type of way, but they were connected narratively. And the historical backdrop was doing a lot of work. Last point I have is low maintenance. Now, this means something in particular. This just means the setup and and tear down. When you get into things like the bookkeeping, yeah, I really enjoy that. Like when we're talking about a, a kingdom death monster, mm-hmm. and we're sitting there for most of the time, sort of advancing our village and 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 changing our our characters and and doing story stuff. I love all of that, but just the, the sort of, you know, now it's time to put it away. Yes. And you're like slowly, you know, putting all these cards where they're supposed to go and everything else. So low maintenance, like we just talked about troll bag, you literally troll just, bag legends, yeah. troll bag legends, you literally just fold up the boards and put the stuff away. Yep. Whereas these, sometimes these other games are a, a huge production just to get them back. So you can remember what you're doing. Yeah. That's one of the, I think oath sworn gets almost everything right. Except this part. There's a lot of different boxes to, to wrestle, and it's just the components are creeping all over the place. Now, to a certain extent, it's to a good end, but there you have it. And honestly, th- this this dovetails into my biggest objection to what a lot of these campaigns do, and one of the reasons why I keep talking about Oathsworn so positively, and that is I'm tired of games giving me more social obligations, of having to have the same group of people come back at the same time. It's 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 hard enough. You know, you plan, you think, you know, on day X, we're going to go, we're going to play the latest and say, oh, someone can't make it or someone else can make it. I don't want to be that guy at the game night saying, no, 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 we're full. We made the pre-arrangement. You, get, you, you don't get to hang out, hang out with us now because we're playing session 12 of this thing that we started. No, you should let people be able to drop in and drop out relatively painlessly. A lot of campaigns do this. A lot of campaigns don't. And quite frankly, I think it is worth the extra development time to make the game the least like an obligation as possible. And part of that is that flexibility. Part of that is the ability to set up quickly. Part of that is the ability to just be able to transport the damn thing. Modular expansions can help with this. The ability to have very clear leveling up patterns can help with this. And I, I really appreciate it when, it when developers go that extra mile to make it clear that I'm not shouldering a, like getting a pet or having a child just by deciding to try their game. <laughs> the last thing I want to just quickly talk about is Blood Bowl, because we haven't really talked about it. And I don't think there's many games that have that type of campaign and have done it so successfully. Like for like a sports sort of seasonal campaign where, you know, you're progressing all of you know, like an entire team of characters. Yes. It's 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 its own beast for sure. That's true, and it, it, for a long time, the only campaign games in existence were those people that were still going back to the Games Workshop specialist games. More time, Necromunda, Blood Bowl. Like, for a while, that was more or less it. Like some people would go back to even things like Hero Quest Advance or Warhammer Quest stuff like that. You know, I kind of miss back when campaigns were a novelty. <laughs> like that was great. Like I played More Time back in the day. Not even back in the day, but it was long out of print because that's that's the only kind of campaign was going on. Because you know, we we played normal games, and it's like, ooh, a campaign. Yes, it was broken. Yes, it was unbalanced as all get out. But it was all right because it was the one. Sem- now it's just ugh, <laughs> ugh. Ugh, indeed. Yes. The, and the only time where I really felt like it was worth it getting the same people over and over and over again, specifically, and I was okay with those restrictions, was The King's Dilemma. Precisely because we built that world. That world felt indelibly like it had all of our fingerprints all over it. And we would remember who did the thing five games ago that caused this thing to happen. It constantly kept being brought up. All other times... I'm willing to suffer through those kinds of campaigns when they are so inflexible, but I resent it. And it's an obligation that I wish I didn't have to put yeah, up Yeah, I can't think of another board game campaign system that that I enjoyed as much as King's Dilemma. Yeah. And well, again, not not so much not so much for the like the actual intricate gameplay. Right. But I mean, for, right for the because you, you generally playing. don't like negotiation games, yeah. and it was a negotiation game. But you loved the world, you loved the dynamics, and, yes. and you you wanted to see what happened. Exactly. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And, and the story, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All good. Yep. Yeah. And so I 
I remain somewhat enthusiastic about Trudvang Trid- Legends precisely because it's just so, it's so breezy in comparison to a lot of the other things. Imagine that. Talking about <laughs> a Kickstarter from, from Simon being called breezy in comparison to a lot of these other things. Breezy. I will, I am going to go back to Legacy of Dragonhold because the writing is so good and I'm associated with my character and I, I still want to give at least one more shot to that stupid boss in Oathsworn because I really like the writing and I really like how flexible it is and I want to see what it does with it. But I uh, part of that is because I'm more sold on the combat system than you are. Yeah, no, I, w- I want to like it. <laughs> so those are our thoughts on campaign systems. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. That's it for this week. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Next Monday, we will not be recording an episode because we will be at Shucks. But we will definitely be uh, having enough content for all our loyal patrons. We will be back in two weeks' time with another regular episode. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.